Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Totola. Welcome to The One Shade Show. Any dentist knows that there are 16 shades on a standard shade guide, but this is the show where we say fat to 16 shades, and we only talk about one shade, and its name is Universal. As a young boy, I could only dream of a world where I would never need to take out a shade guide for posterior composite restorations. And who, pray tell, made that dream come true? None other than Curare Noritake, the company that has brought us such game-changing legacy products as Panavia and Clearfill SE Bond. One has nearly eliminated post-operative sensitivity with our restorations, while the other has kept millions of crowns on short, over-tapered preps. And with the introduction of Clearfill Majesty ES2 Universal, go ahead and set your mind to blown right now. The Curare principle is intelligent simplification, the process of making dentists more efficient with no loss in restoration quality. I know what you're thinking, Mike, enough words. Let's see some before and after pictures. All right, settle down. To see those cases, we're gonna bring on one of the clinicians who has had the chance to put Majesty Universal through its paces for the last few months prior to product launch. Our guest today is Dr. Steve Schiffenhaus from Gilbert, Arizona, and the name of Steve's practice is Soft Touch Dental. Steve, I'm always fascinated by the names um, that dentists choose for their practices. How did you come up with Soft Touch? Do you have a Soft Touch? I always think about um, a sight gag on The Simpsons where it said uh, the name of the practice was Painless Dentistry, and underneath it it said Formerly Painful <laughs> Dentistry. And uh, I always think of that, awesome. so I, I, I like you know hearing about how a dentist decided to choose, um, for example, soft touch. So uh, is there a story behind that? Yeah, so I bought the practice in 2017 and it was already called soft touch. But <laughs> I like to think of it as a soft ouch. Actually, the the seller told me that it was really funny. He said, because he's trying to say, you know, if people have trouble spelling it, just just tell them it's a soft ouch. I go, that's pretty funny. Um, I, you know, it's my philosophy. I, I, I try to be pretty gentle. Um, you know, I picked a weird pr profession to be extremely empathetic. And right. it, it, it helps you in a lot of times, but sometimes you just have to get something done. And I'm like, oh, oh, can I? You know, it's just, it can be difficult. Um, but I'm actually probably going to rename the practice and rebrand pretty soon because my focus is biomimetic dentistry. So I'm probably going to call it like Gilbert Center for Biomimetic dentistry or something like that but uh, that's that's the story that's the yarn behind the name that that with a name like gilbert center for biomimetic dentistry i feel the fees going way up that sounds like now that sounds like a practice that's got some high <laughs> fees compared to soft touch well, it helped me not go out of business with the time I'm taking on these procedures. That would be good. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say the time you're taking on this interview. I suddenly felt guilty. Oh, no, I love it. <laughs> we're going to take a look at those procedures in, uh, in just a minute. Before we do that, we have a segment we like to call a shady past. What we're looking for here is um, we're hoping that you'll tell us about any felonies uh, you've had before, any jail time that you did, any secret families that you have or something like that. If you have anything shady in your past, uh, I'd like to go ahead and encourage you to confess it now. But if you don't, we'll just go ahead and take a, an embarrassing story from school or something like that. So it's really funny this came up because on Instagram we were doing this like eight things about you thing, uh, thing we were posting and it was supposed to be like a mix of like some weird stuff people wouldn't know but um, I, I graduated almost dead last in my high school and I went to public high school. <laughs> So you know that's that's one thing. There's a there, there's a couple things, but that, that's for starters. How, how did that happen? Were you just not like into the subjects that you were learning? Weren't your parents standing over you, threatening you, or uh... not to throw anyone under the bus? But of the family members, I was the only one looking to go college bound. So they were just kind of happy I was still in school. I was like the least trouble of the of the kids. And then um, it's actually a, a horrible story. I my mom called me the day before graduation, like almost in tears, like, "Well, you did it." You're not going to graduate. I'm like, well, what do, you, what do you mean? They said, you're not graduating. And I was actually in the middle of playing beer pong in someone's <laughs> garage. Um, and it was like on a, on a weekday. And uh, so this is getting bad. So um, I think I waited until I sobered up because uh, I didn't have much. I think I just had a beer. So I waited till later. And then I actually went to the school. And what the issue was is that, um, you know, you could miss 10 classes. Um, you know, so I used to be, I had a system worked out in my head to when I could cut classes. And I, and I kept track of all of them. And the way you game the system was you didn't sign into homeroom so you wouldn't be on the teacher's roster so they couldn't catch you cutting. Well, the issue was is that it showed that I had over 10 absences. So I had to go track down all my teachers and get their actual, because back then they kept roll books. 
I had to go find all the roll books and Xerox that I had not missed more than 10 of those classes. And then I graduated. So that's just a slice of my high school career. So that might give you a clue. So, so by the way, the short answer to my question, how did this happen is beer pong on a weekday. And uh, that's one thing. And, and, and you're like this incredible, evil, lazy genius. You're putting so much time into, you know, coming up with all the classes you miss, going to those teachers. Yes. If you had just put that dedication into the studies itself, it might have been easier. I'm guessing things changed during college. You did become a dentist after all. Did, did you become a better dentist and less beer pong when you got to uh, college? No, not right away. I started a fraternity, um, so that was that was tough. And then, uh, and then I don't know if I was welcomed at ASU for for some time. And then uh, I decided to get my stuff together. Um, you know, this is, I guess, a first world problem, right? Um, and then I, I actually put everything uh, on the wall to go into medicine. Um, and that's that's when I picked it. And that was the issue. I'm I'm just one of those types. If I'm not inspired to do something, I'm not going to do it. Um, and that was a problem in high school. I didn't have any direction. I just you know you just classic. You know, middle class, upper middle, whatever you want to call it. Like, oh, you do school, you go to college, and you know, you work at a computer or something like that. So I didn't really care. And then I chose a vocation that I thought would kind of take everything uh, in my energy to go prove that I am smart, that I that I can be this, and I'm very competitive. And so I turned it into something competitive. And then you know, it was a long road, and I went out going into a PhD program from molecular biology. I got a second master's. I taught a lot, and then I went to dental school. <sighs> Um, and so that's, my wife has always teased me what you just said. It's like, you know, if you use your powers for good, you know, good things will happen. And that's why I started my online institute and I do teaching and Instagram influencing and all that because I'm just trying to take this crazy and put it in a good place. Well, you finally did. I mean, this story's got a happy ending. You ended up getting, you overcompensated by getting like all this education, which has helped. So you, you've really studied the same amount of hours as anyone else. You just really backloaded it without a lot at the front. But but you're being, <laughs> yes. you're being way too humble. When you said you started a fraternity, I assumed it was going to be at some small Catholic college in the middle of nowhere. You started a fraternity at Arizona wow. State University. This is one of the biggest party schools in the nation. That's incredible. This is legendary Animal House type stuff. <laughs> tell tell me what what made you want to start a fraternity? What was, what was unsatisfactory about the other 20 fraternities that were there where you had to start the 21st or whatever it was? Well, this is really funny. I'm just not big into hazing, oh, like getting okay, hazed. Yeah. And so I looked at all this stuff and I saw the way they're treating and I and I get it. There's like a rite of passage thing and all that. And that's, I mean, when it's not taken to like dangerous right, right. extremes, but you know what I mean? And in East Coast hazing versus West Coast is nothing. I should have known better when it, because I'm Jersey from Jersey. When I came out here, the hazing is not the same. But anyway, uh, I just didn't want to do the whole hazing thing. <laughs> Um, I just don't like being someone's, you know, like whipping right. boy. So, so that's really cool. So it's not, it's not as goofy as it sounded. You know, it, it wasn't like driven necessarily by, Ooh, I, I want to make a better place for everyone to get drunk. It, it was more about having a non hazing, you know, oh. having a supportive environment. Yeah, no, I know that stuff yeah. still happened, but that's kind of cool. That's kind of yeah. honorable that you did it that way. I appreciate you saying that it segues into what I'm doing now with uh, creating the Bard Institute and uh, you know, doing my own teaching platform is just that I tend to, if there's not something that I want out there, I try to go create it. Um, you know, I want to create a place that I want right. to be. And luckily it tends to be another place that other people want to be and they tend to grow. So, um, you know, I didn't realize at the time it seemed like a goof off thing, like, you know, we right. joked about, but it wound up actually being an, an important life skill that I yeah, learned. Yeah, that's that's amazing to create a, a social organization out of nothing. And you're right, there's no better training for what you're doing in education now. Uh, just like I don't think there's, you know, I worked in restaurants growing up and um, before dental school, like in high school and college. And I think there's no better training for being a dentist than um, being a, a waiter or a server where you've got six tables in a section. They're all at different points. You got to take care of them to make sure everything's... It's not unlike working oh. at a two or three operatories and having one or two hygienists that need to be checked. It's just good mental training for being in a busy fee-for-service mm -hmm. practice. So let's take a look at uh, some of these pictures, this case that you sent us here. Um, tell me about this uh, first case. This is somebody who's got sealants on some of their pits of their teeth, but obviously we've got something going on in that occlusal group. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a this is a cool case. Um, this um, this person is a health professional uh, that was following me on Instagram. 
Uh, I'm going to try to leave the details minimal because, you know, I don't think we risk HIPAA here, but I still like to protect everybody. Um, and it was a virgin tooth, but they felt that they had cracked it. They, 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 they looked in the mirror. They swore they could see a crack. They were having actual throbbing pain on the tooth, which made me a little nervous to start. I've done a couple. I've got a couple cases like this under my belt now. Uh, so I'm a little bit more confident. But anytime someone's, you know, uh, presenting with non spontaneous, you know, spontaneous throbbing pain, you know, I, I'm a little bit nervous, even though that is actually a, of what wound up happening. I still was a little nervous going into it. Um, so I took a look and I, I actually used this picture. You can see the crack, but I used caries detecting dye as well to discover the crack on the virgin tooth. So I told the patient, hey, you know, this could go either way. I did it in patient speak, but this can go indirect or this right. can go direct. I'm going to start conservatively, uh, but I showed the patient the fee for an overlay or an onlay. Mm -hmm. Um, and I opened it up and you can see the crack really only extended about a third, uh, I want to say like three, four millimeters into the mm -hmm. dentin. And so um, I excavated the crack out as much as I could into the dentin. Um, and you can see that that's that's a classic dissection photo. You can kind of see like that 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 ring right yep. there. Um, I don't know if we'll have time to get into it in, in, in during this, but the most important thing to me isn't necessarily getting the crack out of enamel because sometimes, you know, especially in approximately, you can chase it all the way down the side of the root. For me, it's getting it out of the dentin. And if I can't get out of the dentin, I at least want to get it out of the DEJ area. The DEJ is a natural shield, uh, crack deflecting shield. So if we can kind of restabilize the tooth by bonding it and getting the crack out of the DEJ, we have a pretty good chance of stabilizing and not having it to continue. So in that photo, you can see a little bit of the crack still in the enamel. Right. It's mostly out of the dentin. Uh, you had pointed out earlier that um, you can almost faintly see it still in the dentin. So the rule I use, and you can stop me at any point if I wind up talking too much. Uh, the, 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 the rule I use is I use uh, an air abrasion unit, so sandblasting unit. And what's nice is it helps you see composite that might still be re remaining that you couldn't see. It makes it kind of rough and opaque. But with cracks, it's really nice because um, it'll start like, It'll, it'll send the dust into the crack and it'll, it'll turn white and you can see it. So my rule generally is, you know, avoid a pulp exposure and try to get rid of all the crack uh, or get rid of the crack to the point where it's not collecting white dust anymore, meaning it's either gone or so small, you're not even getting like, you know, 25 to 50 microns size dust particles into it. Um, and so that's the point we were at here. Sometimes it looks like it's stained from the crack, but not actually the crack still being open. Okay. And then after that, because there was a possibility of the crack maybe remaining a little bit because of that little bit of stain, I um, it's hard to see in this picture, but I had layered ribond buccal lingually over the dentin going like this. And it's about a three millimeter wide strip. Um, and then I rebuilt it. I, I, I built the enamel shell first. Uh, it's, a, it's a technique people are using more and more now um, because then it turns it into a class one. So what's nice is you can take your like I use a garrison ring. So I can take my garrison ring out. I can take the um, the sectional matrix out. I have a better field of view. And then now this is a class one, which is a lot, a lot easier and straightforward. So the, the ribbon is kind of shaped like a skateboarding half pipe with the two walls being against what's remaining yeah. of the buckle and lingual cusps. And then the base of that half pipe goes down along that, the DEJ of yeah. the ribbon, it gets bonded down into that. Um, I know we're all concerned about polymerization shrinkage with uh, composites. What effect does the the rib on him yeah. on that kind of shrinkage. So Ollie Sauter has a really good paper uh, with Jujun Tagami that just came out in 2019. Um, but there's a even more, it's a repeat of a paper in 2006 from Semabelli. So this is very well researched. Um, one thing we can say for a fact in the literature is that, um, you know, the, the enemy of, of, of bond formation in dentin is early polymerization shrinkage stress. We've known that since the 80s. The, the dentin bond takes a while to form. It's a wet environment. Enamel is easy to bond to because you get it dry, hardens really quick. But in a wetter environment, the, the the adhesive takes a little bit longer to harden. So like any glue, you want to let it set for a while before you mess with it. Think about, you know, looting old school crowns, you know, when you when you put a or people are still doing it, you put, you know, like something like Rely X in a zirconia crown, shove it on there. Do you start pulling up on it really hard right away? No, that's not good, right? Because it's going to come off. You want to wait till it sets a little bit before you start screwing with it. So that's essentially what we need to do to our dentin bonds. Um, and that's hard to do in, you know, in most practice settings, you know, depending on how fast we have to work. So what's nice about what Ribbon does is when you put it over the dentin floor, over the bond layer, it acts as a stress breaker 
where when you put the incoming composite over the top and you cure it and it starts to shrink, the ribbon will actually absorb that stress and not transfer mm. it below. And that's shown in uh, Ollie Sauter's paper. He actually has really cool like OCT uh, uh, filming of it. Um, Sima Belli has that. And so you actually, and then they did microtensile tests, you'll actually get much higher bond strengths to your dentin because you protected it and allowed that, that bond to mature more. So that's the first effect it has. It's not well documented, you know, how good it is at splitting cracks. There was a test they did where they did like a notch in teeth and put ribbon over it. And they didn't really see necessarily an increased fracture resistance, but it's just kind of common sense putting some rebar down there that's going to you know, right. hold things is going to help. And anecdotally, I've seen great results with it as, as long as a lot of my mentors, the patient was pain free the next you day. You know, it's interesting you say that because it, it, it totally makes sense. You can picture the rib on being able to deform and take up that shrinkage without affecting yeah. that uh, maturing um, dentin hybrid layer that we're trying to form. And when you say that, it makes me think, you know, you can make a pretty good rationale for almost any time you did a deep or even class one down into Denton that you would lay down some rib on as, as the base layer for that restoration. Is there anybody who's doing that routinely, always putting the rib on down before they do any direct composite restorations? Yeah, so that's something I definitely teach in um, in my courses. It's something I learned from David Alleman um, and Simone Della Perry, uh, who teach biomimetic dentistry. Uh, and it's it's a cool concept called hierarchy of, of bondability as well. I, I love to nerd out on this, <laughs> stop, this stuff, so stop me at any point. but. You know, different parts of dentin um, uh, mature at different rates because they have higher or lower bond potentials. Like, you know, deep dentin has wider tubules, it's wetter, it's less mineralized. So the ultimate bond strength is not as high as like superficial, highly mineralized dentin. So you're fighting like a bunch of battles in deep dentin in a deep class one, which is you got stuff that doesn't get high bond strengths to begin with. And then it's at the deepest part of the prep, uh, and which means you're going to have a larger piece of composite more polling. So yes, typically what I will do is if I have to leave any arrested decay behind, and sometimes infected decay, as I, I told you uh, off screen that I do practice some selective removal in certain cases, um, that's tough to bond to too. So by putting that rib on over, I'm sort of protecting that weak area and allowing it to get better bond strengths and not allowing it to get pulled on. So that's, that's definitely something I teach and I do almost routinely. Well, that's great. I really like the contact, the contours that you got here. I mean, it, it looks fantastic. And, and to your point, it's now a, a simple class one to be able to restore because of what you did with the rib bond and, and building up that um that marginal ridge and that um that disappears into the tooth that's a pretty good endorsement a testimonial for majesty universal are you pleased with how that disappears into the tooth when you look at that yeah i really love this one um this one it was funny because i talked to my friends at uh carari about this one i had sent it to them and they were like hey we really want a case where it's pure universal so you know i i universal made up that whole enamel shell and the upper millimeter of of the composite but i you know if we're doing full disclaimer i i, I think i use clear fill apx um as the dentin replacement just because i'm a maniac i use five different composites so this case the outer layer is the universal um but yeah this was glorious this is I, this is i think one of the first times i used it and i was really impressed and actually what's really cool about it too is i used it in the heated form I have never seen a heated composite that just like gooshes. Like it is like like really flowable when it comes out when it's heated. It is like glorious <laughs> um, as a heated composite. Um, so I, I really love the finish um, on this. I thought it was good. We had a glitter party. Do you want me to tell that story? Uh, yeah, I'm wondering. It looks like, um, yeah, it looks like you celebrated with granulated sugar or something. I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> <laughs> this was awesome. So the patient um, had to take a bathroom mm -hmm. break half halfway uh, or like partway through this procedure, and there must have been a fold in the rubber dam where some of the uh, the aluminum oxide <laughs> dust got stored. Because when she came back, there was like this litter party. So I cleaned it up with uh, with some uh, with some bond. It wound up not having an effect. It wasn't a big deal. But it's funny because I I showed her the pictures later. And we were joking about it because she knows about dentistry. I'm like, yeah, we had a, you had a glitter party in the bathroom. I don't know what was going on there. It's funny because if this restoration ends up lasting for 70 years, you're going to be the one who found out that accidentally introducing aluminous oxide into the composite while you're doing it <laughs> makes it last an extra 50 years. That's like, um, you know, all kinds of great oh. things are discovered by mistake. You know, you know, like cheese, for example. There was a... Um, 
there was this guy who was crossing um, the desert and he was bringing his milk with him to drink and he was carrying it in a sheep's stomach, you know, as well. That was the Toomey bag of the time. And so because of the sun and the sloshing of the cheese and the enzyme reddit in, in the sheep's stomach, when he got to drink his milk, it was like curds and whey. And he, he liked it. There was the whey to drink and the curds to eat. And that's how cheese, you know, yeah. the invention of cheese basically and how to do it. So you never know. Uh, you may want to patent this now just in case. You, you know, for your for your children or your children's children to be able to use this for their sake. Yes, <clears throat> that looks nice. That looks really nice that really. looks really good. That, that deglitterized. That deglitterized version. exactly. Yeah. Tell me about this one. So this was an interesting case. Um, this was a friend of a coworker, um, and uh, they had heard about the glitter party, so they wanted to get in on it. Um, they presented in my office and uh, asymptomatic on tooth number four, the uh, upper right second premolar for anybody that's European watching this. Um, and I took a look on the x-ray and it looked like the whole mesial half of the tooth was decay. A distal half of the tooth was decay. I'm shocked that when you look at this clinical photo, you can't see anything going on with what was going on underneath. Yeah. And I tested, I pulp tested it completely normal pulp test. Um, like, you know, Put, you know, cotton pellet, endo ice, dried the tooth, put it on the tooth, raised her hand, took it off, put it down in five seconds, no lingering pain. The rest of the quad tested the same right. way. It, teeth are amazing. Yeah, that, the, uh, it, it, you know, how old is the patient? Uh, early, early 30s. 30s. So maybe, you know, somebody in the, I don't know, 60s doesn't have that healthy a pulp by that point, And maybe it doesn't react as as well as that. But yeah. uh, obviously the hole <laughs> was exactly the size or close to the size that the radiograph told you, wasn't it? Yeah, it was it was pretty down there. Um, I, I I really regret not giving you the post up bite wing. I, I, I was like reticent, as I told you, because I didn't like the, the contour on the on the bite wing, even though it wound up having a contact and being clinically acceptable. But the slam dunk part of it was that gingival seal was money um, and it, it wound up really working out. Um, but yeah, it really went down. Like on the x-ray, it looks like I was on top of bone, but I don't think that's what it is because we, we all know the interproximal bone is shaped like this, right? right? buckle, lingual, and then we go down here. So I think really I probably had some room because I had Teflon below the finish line. So there had to be at least a millimeter or two down there. Um, but yeah, it went, it went pretty low. Um, and this is a great example of what I was talking about, about using ribond on a compromised piece of dentin. So I had to leave some arrested and a little bit of an infected dentin behind. Um, again, it's an academically accepted technique. It's not really popular in the States yet for reasons that I understand. And you know, not going to get too much of a tangent, but I, I believe in giving the pulp a chance. Uh, that's just my restorative philosophy. And the, the big key is when, you know, you're near the pulp or you have something compromised, you know, remaining dent in thickness is, an, is, is a factor, but also micro leakage is a factor. So it just means the stakes are higher for getting good bonding, which again is why the rib bond is down there. The rib bond does two things in this case is it protects the bond formation over the kind of beat up dentin uh, that's in the center of the tooth. Um, but it also creates a cool fail safe, which is something I didn't talk about before, which is anything that has like a fiber reinforcement, like the DEJ, fractures tend to happen away from it. Like when you have a crack that, that hits a different interface, it displaces laterally and, and the energy goes away. So if this composite ever fails or breaks, it should break above the ribbon. And then I'll be presented with a case where I need to come in and then go do maybe an onlay or an overlay or something. But the, the main benefit there for me was kind of protecting that that, that beat up dentin um, and just protecting the bond and giving a better adhesive environment. Oh, that's really interesting. Uh, if you had to have a, a fracture, that's how you'd want it to happen. Tell me a little more about how you got such good gingival isolation on that deep margin like that. I mean, I can see the Teflon tape, but what is the actual technique of getting the rubber dam down there and being able to isolate it that well? So this this was interesting. This one went a lot smoother than it should have. Um, I, I have cases where like I think it should go smooth, and I'm like, why is my life horrible <laughs> right now? And then there's cases where I, I have no idea why this is working, but let's go with it. Um, this was a combo of the two. I've gotten a lot more used to doing these types of cases. So the actual technique here is, for one, I really recommend people, if they want to get good retraction of gingival tissue with a rubber dam, use a heavy gauge rubber dam um, and use a high quality sheet. Um, there's not that many high quality sheets out there. Uh, there's there's a couple brands that, that are pretty good. This one is a really, really, really good one. It's very elastic, but it's also very, very heavy. Um, 
So starting with a quality sheet and a heavy gauge will help retract. You'll get a lot of gingival retraction. Uh, the other thing you do is when I realize I'm, I'm getting deep and I'm at a point at which I'm about to tear the dam, I will pack Teflon like a cord. Mm -hmm. So the Teflon, just like a cord would to tissue, it will de displace the tissue apically and laterally. And so what I'm doing in this case is once I knew I was getting deep, I wadded up like a cord, the Teflon, and advanced it apically and laterally. And what's nice is it'll actually push the dam down apically. And if you've inverted the dam properly, it'll push that inversion down with the Teflon. The other nice thing about Teflon and why we're using it more in dentistry is that it's water resistant. So, you know, cord will soak up water and kind of act as a, as a fluid reservoir, which in a deep situation like this, what's it hanging on to? Is it hanging on to blood and putting that into your hybrid layer? You know, with Teflon, it's not soaking anything up. Once you dry it, it's dry. Uh, and the other nice thing about Teflon is when you cut into it, it it just cuts away. It, it's not like cord where you'll get those dangly threads that'll suck up into your burr. So a, a big key here is is probably, you know, when you know you're going deep, getting having enough sheet between the teeth, which typically you do, having a good heavy gauge dam, and then using Teflon to your advantage to kind of displace the dam and, and, and help keep a seal for you. Because I think that deep, some of that seal wasn't even the dam, it was the Teflon. Wow. So are you ever just using Teflon tape to, to pack cord around a crown preparation have you if you, you really just no cord just all teflon yeah. tape i like it interesting better. yeah I, I it works better in my hands i don't i don't um often have to do um i mean i probably packed like three or four cords in a year right, right. Uh, even with teflon um i've actually been doing a lot of my scanning with the rubber dam on which i love because the dam retracts yeah. the tissue so i have the tissue retracted and i have hemostasis um, and at least the prime scan is smart enough to stitch everything together and have it work out well, because I've been doing it for, for almost a year now. But I think the other scanners are, are there too. So, so I often will, will do everything with the dam on because we have a great visual field for the scanner. All right, and then on the next picture, tell me about how you uh, filled that. So it's similar to the other one that you saw, which is, um, you know, we talked about letting the, the dentin bond form. You know, it, it's a similar concept to immediate dentin sealing. The longer you let the dentin bond mature before you stress it out, the stronger it's going to be. So my strategy when I do, you know, proximal lesions is that um, if, if, if this is a lot easier with a rubber dam in place, but it's not a bad technique for like an isovac or something like that, which is when I'm done prepping and I'm ready to bond, right? The first thing, you know, we're taught to do, or I was taught to do is you get your matrix band on, right? You get your sectional and your wedge and your garrison. But a little gamesmanship would be, if you can make sure you don't spill over your margins, do your bonding now, then go assemble your sectional matrix. So by the time you have all that on, you've waited five minutes. So you, now you've had your bond formed for five minutes. So typically that's that's my, my strategy is um, I'll air braid, you know, in this case, I air braided the dentin, um, and we can talk about that later. It's not critical, but it, it does help with dentin bonding. So I air braided the, the dentin. Um, I did my bonding. Um, I did resin coating, which is just a, another way of saying put in a flowable liner. It does help with your bond strengths. Um, and then normally I would then put my sectional on, but in this case, I then placed the rib on. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I fixated the rib on onto that part of the tooth, cured it. Then I put my sectional on. Then I did the enamel shell. Then I cure, did like a like a tack cure on that, pulled everything out, full cure on that. And now we're in a class one situation and built it up incrementally. You know, it's really interesting because all, all you're talking about doing is reordering the steps of what you do things to give the, the tooth and adhesive that benefit of extra time. And it reminds me of a, I was interviewing uh, Dr. Steve Buchanan, you know, the endo guru out here in Santa Barbara. And Steve was talking about uh, one of the best uh, irrigants or fluids you can use uh, during a root canal was, uh, uh, he said, a cappuccino. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he said, you just need to let the, you need to let the sodium hypochlorite sit in the canals for 45 minutes and go have a cup of coffee and just leave it alone and let it do its thing. He's actually working on something now that's constantly circulating fresh uh, sodium hypochlorite through the tooth. So it's done at 13 minutes and gets all the lateral canals and isthmus spaces. But it's one of those things awesome. where if it, it, and the interesting counterintuitive thing was, you know, we all did, if you're as old as me, multiple visit molar endo in dental school. And then the, everything shifted to um, single visit when we were able to file so quickly with engine driven nitie files. But the downside that nobody initially realized was now the sodium hypochlorite wasn't spending 
a lot of time inside the tooth on multiple appointments and endodontists start seeing uh, their failures start to increase. And so they went back to multiple visit endo and uh, started getting better results again. And it was all because of this, you know, having the irrigant in the tooth like that for a certain amount of time to let it work. And so to your point, just at least you don't have to walk away for 45 minutes and let that, um, you know, dent and bond start to mature. All you have to do is reorganize, you know, the steps of what you do and not be in a hurry and realize that if it's six or seven minutes, you know, instead of five minutes, it's better. But if it's two or three, it's not going to be as good as as five anecdotally. So yeah. um, that's really great. So that's, um, is that, that looks like obviously post polish there. That's a great looking restoration too. Yeah, that was final polish. Um, that, yeah, I was really pleased with this. Uh, and this is, this was pure universal, um, uh, majesty universal. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, I, I didn't use anything else. I mean, I used the flowable and the rib on, but, but short of that, this entire, um, composite restorations made of the Majesty Universal, and I, I was really pleased. And really, what I again, what I love about it is I'm using it heated. I mean, not heated. It's still, you know, I like very low viscosity composites. I mean, that's just my bread and butter. So this is just really speaks to me being like an amazing low viscosity, uh, creamy uh, composite. But it's even crazier heated. So um, yeah, I was really, really pleased with this outcome, uh, especially given the clinical situation. So I'm hoping this is one of those in five years, the tooth is doing fine. And I can say, Hey, this is an example of not something you would do every day. You know, a lot of times you would do an indirect here, but you know, anything is possible with the right techniques. Yeah. And and there's other universal composites that, um, need, um, an opaquer or something below them, because if it get, if you get too big of a mass or too wide of a space between say the buccal and lingual margins, they get too translucent and will start to gray out. And you really don't see that happening here. And that's without an opaque or any kind of backing behind it. So Curare has really done a great job of reformulating this composite so that it really does take on um, the colors and shades from the adjacent to structure and brings it into the restoration. Um, even if it's a deeper one or a wider one, we've seen a couple wider ones now yeah. where it really blends in well. Um, well, thank you for sharing those cases. There's just one thing, I, well, last thing I wanted to uh, ask you about about. Um, I saw a um, video of you recently uh, shooting a gun, not at anyone. Uh, it was in the desert uh, shooting at targets. And uh, I found out that you're a competitive pistol and, and rifle shooter. When did you get into this? How did you get into this? Is it Was this start on the East Coast? Because this feels way more like an Arizona thing than an East Coast thing. No, it's an Arizona thing. That's why I can never go back. I don't know what I'd do with all my guns. But actually, funny story was uh, when I met my wife, um, uh, I, I, I pretended that um, I didn't have uh, an assignment for lab class because her, her roommate was my lab partner. So I, so I made an excuse to go over there and get the assignment and meet her because I heard she was cute. <laughs> and um, she was cute. Um, and um, she had a Jets shirt on, which shocked me because, you know, they're a horrible team. Uh, but I'm a Jets fan, unfortunately. But, hey, what are the odds? And she was uh, getting her gun ready to go shooting. And so, oh, wow. um, you know, she actually was when I went shooting with, um, and then I bought um, an HK USP 45 because of that scene in the movie Collateral, Tom Cruise, where he's like, hey, homie, <laughs> you got my briefcase. That seems awesome. So I got that gun, um, and then I started shooting, competitive shooting, because I'm just a competitive person. I just, everything has to have a pers- purpose or I'm, like, bored. It's a, it's, it's a character flaw and, and, a, and a bonus. I don't know. Um, and then I got into competitive shooting. I put it down for a few years, and then when I graduated dental school, I picked it back up again. But then kids happened, mm-hmm. so I, I infrequently actually do the competitions, but I do go out and shoot in the desert at least once a month or at my local range, rifle and pistol. And again, it's just like with golf. I can't just go to the driving range and just whack balls. There's got to be a plan in place, and I'm training. I'm not a lot of fun. You don't want to have Well, I do, I do triathlons, and I'm the same way. I am not going to go out and just do a random bike ride. I'm probably going to be on my indoor trainer doing part of a coaching plan, doing these specified intervals, whether it's at lactate threshold or anaerobic. I mean, it's not fun. It's much more fun to go out and just ride your bike on a Saturday and then stop and get a cup of coffee and eat a chocolate croissant and come home. But I'm much more about efficiency. And if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it and get better about it. I got to be able to see progress and take these FTP tests and see that I can put out more watts for a longer period of time. So I get that. If I'm going to do something and spend time doing it, I want to do it as well as I could and really see how far uh, I can go with this. But I grew up in California. There's not that many guns. I mean, there's some guns. I was just never exposed to them. So it's interesting 
interesting. You're the third dentist that I've talked to and interviewed recently who's really into guns. The other two happen to be in Texas. But tell me, is there any connection, anything you see in common uh, between, say, uh, shooting and dentistry that I, I wouldn't know about because I haven't shot? Do you see? Like, I like to fly fish a lot. And if you get it, really get into it, yeah. you start tying your own flies. All of a sudden, it feels a lot like dentistry, where we're working with these little objects and trying to make them perfect and trying to take it start to, especially for a dentist who does their own crowns like you do with, with Sarek. You know, now you're you're making yeah. your own flies and tossing them out there, and it's it's kind of the thinking man's fishing versus using bait and being on a lake. I'm wondering, are there any parallels between competitive shooting and dentistry that you see in terms of personality, temperament, or skills? You know, it's funny because I've always thought, and I, I tried getting into golf a couple of times and I'm just too competitive. I keep on putting it back down because I'm just not where I want to be, which is like probably a lot of people's story. I mean, I made a lot more progress in shooting. And what's really funny is I, I actually compared shooting a lot to golf because mm -hmm. it's one of those rare things where you need to be like concentrated and being doing something athletic, but the actual execution has to be relaxed. It's very, yeah. you know, like a golf shot, you, you don't want too much tension, right? Same thing when you're pulling a trigger on a gun and you're trying to hit a target. Like, you want to draw and get up quick, but then you want that to be calm, right? So you don't jerk it. Um, and so, you know, that part of it, you know, I always kind of, you know, brought back to golf, which was like with golf, you know, you want to have that same sort of level, you know, of execution. But shooting, I guess the only thing would just be kind of hand-eye right. coordination kind of a thing and, and, and that's really it. I, I wish I could give you more than that. You set me up so well. <laughs> Sorry, when I come out to your practice and I do get to hold, I just want to hold it sideways like in a rap video. That's all I want to do. I'm sure that's not the most effective way to shoot it. but Yeah, that would be awesome. Steve, thanks so much for spending a little time with us today and sharing some cases. I really enjoyed getting the chance to do this, uh, this interview with you. And uh, thanks for your time. Well, thank you so much. And I appreciate you giving me the platform. Well, that will about wrap it up for this episode of The One Shade Show. Remember, life gets easier when you only need one shade for your posterior restorations. Go to oneshade.show for more product information and to see additional cases by other great clinicians such as Jeffrey Hoos, Troy Schmetting, and Richard Young. So on behalf of Dr. Steve Schiffenhaus, Kirari Noritake, Practice Passion, and myself, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry.